Good morning. Uh, I am Mike McKee. I'm the Associate Director for the Photonic Science and Engineering Program. And I'd like to introduce Dr. David Hagen, who's the Interim Dean of the College of Optics and Photonics. Dave. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this great event and to offer my congratulations to our spring 2020 graduates. We know this has been a difficult semester and it's been difficult for everyone to complete the degrees in isolation. So I know you had some significant challenges to overcome. So congratulations again on your tremendous accomplishment. And moreover, unfortunately, the pandemic's preventing you from having that wonderful commencement experience with your classmates, friends, and families. But we got something to somewhat make up for it today because we're fortunate enough to get to spend some time with one of the leading scientists in our field, Nobel laureate Donna Strickland. We actually asked Dr. Strickland to talk to our graduates and instead of a one-way talk, she offered to do a live question and answer session. So that's where we are today. We actually got two sets of audience members today those participating via Zoom, and those watching in the, on the YouTube live stream. In the Zoom session, we have our spring graduates, some alumni, our faculty, and I'm also pleased to welcome Dr. Alexander Cartwright, the president of UCF. Now, Donna, I should point out we're very fortunate here because our president is actually an accomplished optics researcher. So good morning, President Cartwright. D did you want to say a couple of words? Uh, good morning. I, I just want to thank you for having me here. And uh, Professor Strickland, thank you for, for agreeing to be part of this and be at this wonderful institution that has such a long tradition in optics and photonics. So it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I, I look forward to listening in on all the questions uh, and answers. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cartwright. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Donna Strickland, the 2018 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Donna Strickland was born in Guelph, Ontario in Canada, and she became interested in lasers and optics as she studied at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. She pursued her doctoral studies in the US at another fine optics institution, the University of Rochester, where she performed her research on chirped pulse amplification for which she eventually earned the Nobel Prize in Physics. She got her PhD in 1989 and then worked at Princeton University for some time in 1997, she joined the faculty at the University of Waterloo, uh, where she is today. So, Dr. Strickland, good morning. Good morning. So, I'm sure we're going to have quite a few questions, so I'm going to try and get my question in first. And uh, Donna, I'd like you to turn your mind back to the day that you graduated. And how do you think your life was going to be? And how different did it end up? <laughs> uh, well, all right. Um... I, when I was graduating, I knew I wanted to go back to Canada. And I was very fortunate that I got the postdoc I absolutely wanted, which was um, to work with Paul Corkum, which was Canada's leading ultrafast laser person, and at NRC in Ottawa, which is my favorite city in the world. So I, it was a win-win for me. Uh, on the other hand, I had started dating the guy that was going to be my husband, although I didn't know it really at the time, but you know. Um, and he was staying in the United States. So, you know, the two body problem started almost right away, figuring out what to do about that. But no, at no time did I think, oh, you know what? One day I'm gonna win a Nobel prize and just poof. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, well, I guess people dream of those things, but nobody, nobody ever thinks it, yeah. So, um, so <clears throat> there's, that, that spawns a lot of other questions, but I know we've got some other questions from the students. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mike who's going to introduce our first questioner. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. So the first one's going to be Jinhan Ren, uh, who is getting her uh, master's degree today. So Jinhan, you're up. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Strickland, and thanks for being here with us. I would like to ask when and how did you decide to become a faculty member? Was it before you started your PhD or during, or was it before, like later? First, congratulations, Jin Han, for Thank uh, you. graduating. Um, I think, you know, when I was a graduate student and going to conferences, really the only people you see, I mean, back in the day, we had the IBMs and the uh, Bell Labs people, and they were the top-notch scientists as well, but the others were professors. Um, and so I think those are always the ones held up. Um, I didn't go to conferences where there was many industry people, so other than the Bell Labs and the IBM big research labs. 
so I guess that didn't even enter my mind in the same way. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, when, when the two body problem came up, we were, we were sort of contemplating a lot of things, but um, uh, so it was mentioned that I was from Princeton, but I was a member of technical staff there. I was not an academic there. Uh, and so, and that was because my husband was at Bell Labs. So we just kept going and then the job at Waterloo came up and I grabbed it and luckily my husband followed me this time and took an industry job. I see, thank you, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Drew Yuan, you are up next. Uh, he graduated, he's getting in his MS degree as well. And he's got a great question, I think. Good morning, Dr. Strickland, I'm Joe Yuan. Uh, as I was watching your Nobel lecture video, I was deeply impressed by the way you presented light matter interaction and choked pulse amplification to the general public. Since I also do some STEM outreach in Creo, I would love to learn more. How can you explain such in-depth scientific topics in a simple but conceptually correct way to the public without involving too much math or diving into the technical details? Well, thank you, Jian, uh, and, and congratulations to you too. Um, okay, so I've been asked this a bit because some, you know, if you heard my regular talks, you probably wouldn't be as impressed. Um, so I knew that uh, when on October second uh, that I would have to give a public talk for to pick up my uh, Nobel Prize, and I had had the opportunity to see Bill Phillips, I think one of the world's best speakers, uh, give his uh, public talk about his project. And I just automatically thought, oh, how do I do a job like that? How do I do as good a job as that? And when the president of my university asked on that day, what can we do to help you? I said, look, at, I have to give a public talk. I'm no good at making PowerPoint slides. I need people to help with that. And poof, I had a communications team around me. And uh, I worked on that talk, you know, not full time because there were so many things coming at me, but I knew I had to do it in two months. And I was thinking, and I knew someone else was going to be making the slides for me, um, that we worked pretty much over the two months. And then this communications team had me give it to them twice. And so they don't know science at all. So that also helped. Um, but I've had people come up to me and ask me, how did I make my dancing photons? And I went, I have no idea. Somebody else made my dancing photons. I'm just glad I have them. Great. Well, I think it's fair to say then, Donna, that it's it's not just some natural ability. It, it takes hard work. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, and it takes some effort. And but most of the time when we give talks, I don't think we have two months to go. You know, not only do I want to tell you what science I've done, I have to think about that the best way to explain it to you too. Exactly. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Great. Uh, next up is Hannah West who graduated from our undergraduate program and got her bachelor's degree in photonic science and engineering. Hannah, you're up. Hello, I would uh, like to ask, what is your approach to learning a new concept that's outside of your area of expertise? Something that you're interested in or would find useful? Okay, oh, congratulations, Hannah. That's my daughter's name. Um, Okay, so quite often, I think the new ideas probably come to me. I, um, the one I'm still working on, so it's not new to me anymore. But uh, up at Waterloo, we had built this two color laser and a person from Russia contacted me and said, that's the perfect laser for my work in multi-frequency Raman generation. And I went, mm, wonder what that is. But I was always happy. To, I said, look it, I've built a new laser. If you want to use it and I can find a new use for it, great, come on over. Uh, and so, first of all, it helps when somebody comes over or you have that chance to talk to them, because I think that's one of the best ways. And then, of course, the other natural way is to read all the papers on the subject that you can find and, and struggle to learn. But I think, um, and as my daughter is going through and getting her PhD in physics and through her undergrad, I kept telling her it's, it's, it's a team sport. Uh, I don't think you can uh, learn physics and new physics um, without a lot of two-way, three-way, four-way conversation about it. Uh, I think each person has to bring their idea uh, because this is not something, if a new thing, you can't find it in a book because you're trying to do something new. Uh, sometimes we're lucky and usually in the middle of the night or something, it's popping in our heads, but it's also because we've had these conversations back and forth. Great, thanks. Um, I think you know the next person. This is Eric Van Stryland, uh, who is Emeritus Professor and our former Dean, and he's got a question for you. 
Nope, but he's went missing. Yeah, I, I, I gotta, I gotta unmute. <laughs> we really appreciate you doing this for us. Um, so I'd like you to go back and and sort of share with us how did you decide on your advisor and the university you went to. Roger. Ah, okay. So I mean, obviously Creole was not an opera school at the time. Right. So let me start with which school. Um, I chose out, out of the two places in the United States that I applied to, it was Rochester and Arizona, the two optic schools. Rochester is private and Arizona is public. Now as a Canadian, we only have public schools, so I didn't even really understand the difference. Uh, but I applied to both of them and I got into Rochester and I called Arizona and said, are you going to accept me? And they said, we don't even have your, I shouldn't be ratting out another school. Anyway, they said, um, we don't even have your application. And it somehow had gone into what used to be called foreign students. I don't know why foreigns be become a bad word and now it's international, but whatever. In those days, it had gone to the foreign student office and just got lost there. And so Arizona came back and they said, sorry, we've already made our decisions and we never saw your file. So that was wow. sort of why <laughs> I went, okay, then I guess I'll go to Rochester. Um, and then no, honestly, the the first... same thing happened to me. The same thing happened to me at Arizona. Okay. Well, the first week of uh, school, they have this great thing at, at the Institute called Donuts, where all the students and some faculty meet just before the colloquium. Um, and everybody told me, you have to come to Wednesday Donuts. And I wear an iron ring, which means I graduated from a Canadian engineering school. And in walks a guy with the iron ring and he sees it. He goes, I heard there was another Canadian down here. And um, Bezos has said to other people that one of the things he's really done for science is introduce Donna Stripland to Gerard Maru. He said, if you want to study lasers, I know the guy you should work for. You come over to the laser lab with me. And he took me the next day over to the laser lab and showed me Gerard's labs and introduced me to Gerard. And so that was it. And just, you know, his red and green lasers, I just thought looked so cool. Just so cool. I just thought I have to do that. All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, Wei Yu Chen, you are up, and she's also getting her, her master's degree today. Hello. Hello, Dr. Strickland. It's Wei Yu Chen. And my question is for who are studying their PhDs. What recommends do you have for finding a good topics, good research topic, and how would you uh, start that process? Thank you. Hmm. Well, that's probably a harder one to do because I think, congratulations to you, to you, Chen. And Thank you. Good luck getting your PhD. Um, um, I think that partly it's just serendipity, partly it's luck. Uh, I think um, depending on which school you go to, you get that year. Rochester gave us that year just to do classes if we wanted to. Now I'll tell you, I started working with Gerard uh, one month into mine, um, partly because Canadians have a different uh, school system than the US and we're not as broad. And so I'd already taken some of the classes before. Uh, but, and I picked because he was sort of a laser person and I kind of already felt like I wanted to do lasers. But over the years I thought, oh, you know, I might have, you know, also enjoyed quantum optics a bit and I should have maybe gotten around to thinking more about uh, the Bob Boyds and the Carlos Strouds and the Joe Arbelis. Um And I just think that the best way is to uh, talk to the various uh, people that you might want to do work with. I, again, because it's always about a conversation, because I'll tell you, it's not just the research. There's an awful lot of human interaction that has to go on. And so you want to get into a group where you feel comfortable. I think you want to get uh, a supervisor where you feel comfortable. And, and that even means different things to different people. Right, I wouldn't say that Gerard and I were just best palsy wellsies, but we were, you know, able to talk back and forth to each other in a constructive way, um, and and I loved the group. I just thought that group of, of students was fantastic, and then, like I said, uh, I thought the research was just really cool and fun. So, but I think to me, I've always just followed my gut. I'm not the type that you know intellectualizes a lot of it. I just think I just want to have fun, and so I just I go that way. But there's, there's umpteen different ways to figure out who's the right uh, person to work with and what's the right topic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And next up is uh, Joseph Olseth, who again graduated with master's degree today. Joseph, you're up. You're on mute. 
Hi. Hi, Dr. Strickland. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, as researchers, when we're faced with major setbacks, such as like a flawed line of reasoning or um, following the wrong trail, what advice do you have for us to reset ourselves, to um, get a clear head and push forward with purpose? Well, that's always going to happen. Um, certainly, uh, you know, that's possibly why it took me seven years to get my PhD. It wasn't the only reason it took me seven years to get my PhD. Um, partly that was my life's goal was to get a PhD, so I wasn't in a rush. Um, but certainly I didn't publish for the first five years. I mean, this is people are making a big deal of that. My um, first publication is the one that got me a Nobel Prize, but it was also the fifth year of my PhD. So if you don't think I was sweating bullets, um, having gone down many wrong paths uh, to start with, I was sweating bullets. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have to keep going. Uh, so so um, the first project I worked on, I was given a project with a senior uh, grad student, which I think is the way a lot of projects start. And I have to say, I felt really guilty because he had managed to get this semiconductor thing that he needed to be tested from, a, and it was a specialty thing, one of a kind thing, and I managed to destroy it. So that was not so bad for me because I was in my first year, but so, so bad for him because he was trying to finish his PhD. Um, had to feel guilty about that, but you have to move on. So um, I just think I'm a walker. I love to walk and it really um, eases my mind. And so anytime I've gotten to the point where I'm too frustrated, or as I've said before, sometimes I felt like kicking my laser and uh, at least the big power supply. I came close. I never actually kicked it, I don't think. Um, but those are the two things. You either have to sort of get your frustration out in a nice way that doesn't hurt anybody and uh, find something you really enjoy to do. I've heard Gerard say he's a swimmer and he goes um, swimming uh, and I go walking. So you just have to find a way to clear your mind and then just tell yourself that, you know, the next day is a new day and things will work out. Hey, thank you so much. Okay, great. So uh, I want to let you know that right now we have about 100 people watching between Zoom and YouTube, which is really good. Okay, I got a question. I, I was, it's pro, I was going to ask if you were a tree, what tree would you be? But you don't have to answer that. So I'm going to ask when we were doing our Dean search, uh, what is either your favorite book or the most recent book that you've read? Oh, most recent book I've read, that's going to be easier. Um, I think my favorite is probably Pride and Prejudice. That just seems so, but that just seems so, I don't know what I, uh, how many women say that. Um, but I do like it. Uh, the Magpie Murders. I, I love, again, just for something, just to take my mind off of something. I don't like to read anything too deep. I just like to read murder mysteries. And uh, my son had gotten me one, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. It doesn't matter. I don't remember names. And I was just in England, one of my last trips before all of this fell apart. And I thought, oh, it was raining. We tucked into a bookstore. And I said, well, what could I get that would be English? And it was an English author. And, you know, so I thought, okay, I'll just get that one. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. Great. Okay. And the next question is from Sam Knight. He is graduating with his bachelor's from our photonics program. Sam, you are up. Hi, Dr. Strickland. Thanks for taking my, my question. Um, so as an undergraduate student, uh, we face a lot of uncertainty. People tell us go to graduate school, maybe take a job. And I just wanted to ask, what do you believe are the most important steps a graduating student can take in the first five years of their professional career? Mm, okay, well, um, I don't know. Cause I mean, I ha luckily for me, I knew from a little kid, I wanted to do a PhD. So I didn't have to think too hard about that. Uh, I, I always feel sorry for people who have multiple uh, desires to, you know, could go in any way. I was uh, very limiting in what I was good at. Uh, but I personally, I just think that you always have to look inside. I know a lot of my friends when I was graduating, they were trying to do what their parents wanted them to do. And if any parents are watching on YouTube, sorry, I'm not, you know, don't mean to rat you out either. But uh, I said it when I was a fellow student, and I'll say it now that your parents have a right to say, your friends have a right to say, but um, you're the only one living your life. And so you have to decide what would make you happy and um, just decide which things are most important to you. And um, I think if you go to grad school, probably any challenging thing, it's tough and you're going to have to really want to do it or you're not going to stick with it. Right. Um, and so you, you have to really want that in order to do it. 
And otherwise, just figure out what floats your boat and go for it and make sure you're doing it for you and not somebody else. Maybe I could ask a follow up there, Don. Is, is there anything you would have done differently looking back at how you, your career went? Uh, would you have made some different choices looking back? Well, I don't know. I don't uh, believe in regrets at all. Um, so no, I don't think I was happy with my grad school. I loved my postdoc. Um, I will tell you the big stumbling block though was after my postdoc, um, I could not find a job, right? The Reagan Star Wars had come and gone and there were laser jocks out there a dime a dozen. And uh, there was a lot of struggles, right? Uh, so I ended up working at a U.S. weapons lab, and that's something I said I would never do, but I did it because, you know, the science was good. But again, it was right across the country from my new husband, so that's tough, right? Um, so, but, you know, you have to make choices, and so I didn't want to be unemployed, so I took a job. Then I wanted to be with my husband, so I took a member of technical staff job. And all these things you just, you do because you have to do what's right at the moment. So... I don't know that I can go back and say, oh, if, if, if. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, two different schools in Canada offered me uh, faculty positions or offered to have me come out and interview for faculty positions straight after my postdoc. And I, right, without even interviewing, I said, well, unless there's something for an American husband, I, there was no point in me even interviewing. And they said, no. So I didn't even interview. Um, maybe I should have. <laughs> pushed harder on that, but nowadays the two body problem is being looked at a lot more seriously than it used to be. Um, so no, I just believe, you know, I just, I just go where it goes and, and, and I always believe in making the best of every situation you're in. So it didn't matter where I went, even if I didn't think it was the ideal thing, I tried to make it the best for me. Sure, absolutely. And well, things, things didn't work out too badly for you either. <laughs> Life worked out, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is Latifa Maserani. Uh, she graduated from our bachelor's program about a year ago and is now at Duke pursuing her PhD. Latifa. Hi, good morning, Dr. Strickland. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you have any advice to offer a new PhD student on how to know when to be skeptical versus optimistic of a research result that you see in the lab, as well as how to identify great research results or research ideas, excuse me. Uh, I've been asked that a lot. I don't know how you know, but great. Uh, of course, you always have to be skeptical, uh, but you can't be too skeptical. Um, I have to say at the end of my PhD, uh, and Gerard and I have this thing all the time, Gerard loves to say how I said CPA is a nice project, but it's not a thesis. I don't know why he says that, because I'm right. I could not do CPA as my PhD thesis. Uh, and so what I did with it was multi-photon ionization. And we had more intensity than anybody else. And our results didn't match anybody else's. And I questioned and questioned and questioned that. I thought, have I not? And it was like an intense, how much ionization do you get for the intensity? And we needed higher intensity. And I kept thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I think my intensity is higher than it is. And so I certainly, a double check, triple check, we built um, a three, color co correlator so we could test the background better. We, I did everything I could think of, right? Um, and in the end, it's published and, we sh and, and it's right. But um, at, the, at the time uh, I was graduating, they asked me to give a talk about my research to the laser lab, right? Which is separate than, because I was graduating from the Institute of Optics. And so I gave this talk and um, a scientist there called Wolf Sika followed me out and he gave me advice that I've remembered forever. He really chewed me out. He said, Donna, don't ever give a talk like that again. Because I was very apologetic. I kept thinking there must be something wrong with my data and I'm really sorry and I don't really know what's wrong with it. And, but this is what it's showing and uh, we don't understand it. And, uh. and he said, Donna, nobody wants to hear you give a talk um, that you don't believe in. So you figure out what you believe in and give the talk and you talk always from confidence. Uh, and so that was a great lesson. And, but yeah, I, I think you had, I, I think the best way is to let enough other people see your results and really take the criticism and, and listen to what other people say, because this is why we have peer review in science. It's, it is the check to say, this is correct, that you have done everything you can. And sometimes science is proven wrong, but if you've done it all correctly, it's then, you know, mistakes happen and you have to live with that too. But as long as enough people have looked at it and 
you know, agree that you followed all the proper steps, then absolutely you feel good about it. I think, you know, as long as you're advancing science, I think it's good science, you know? Um, I guess what people would consider good is the fact that it really sort of bent a curve. It's not just one incremental step, but you went out on a limb and, and turned the field another way around. Thank you. Can I follow up on her question? So how do you, when you get results that, or, or criticism, how do you separate taking that personally from taking that professionally? Because the work can be very personal. So did you have experiences in the past in which you had to, you know, put some of that aside? And, and, and what do you recommend when somebody sort of has that personal angst of, oh my goodness, this is not going well? It's always a kick in the stomach. But then, so you have to uh, deal with the kick in the stomach and go for a walk or whatever um, and get over that and then go back with your rational brain once, you know, because you, you, luckily each time you, it, it hurts a little less. So you can finally just go back and go, okay, what are they really saying to me? What is it that's either they're not getting and maybe I didn't say it right or, you know, looking to see, am I really wrong? But, but yes, it's very hard. The first time you see it, it's, I think it's very hard and you have to wait until that goes past and then, and then look at it from a rational point of view. Excellent. Uh, I have a question that is coming in from everybody watching on YouTube um, from Shabam Dwada, uh, who asks, um, did you, when you were making a decision on your career path, were you confused or you know, did you have a choice to be, go to industry or stay in academia? And how did you pick between the two? No, I never had a choice. Um, uh, I went after my job as a postdoc. And it was funny. Now, uh, my mom would say at the time, she goes, Don, I taught you to be honest, but this is a little too honest. Um, so I really wanted to work with Paul Corkum. And I have now told the story out. I shouldn't tell it on YouTube, but I won't mention any other names. But somebody else asked um, for me to interview with them. And this is where Gerard, I think, thought I should go. Um, and so I went to the interview. And the, the scientist asked, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be uh, Paul Corkum's next postdoc. I'm just not sure I'm going to get the job. So <laughs> I didn't get that other job. Um, so obviously, that wasn't the right interview skills. So don't do that. Um, but I got the job I really wanted. And after that, I almost didn't get a job. And I was just so grateful. Uh, and I've told this at certain graduation speeches that um, I was coming to the end of my postdoc. I was getting married to a guy living in New Jersey. I had no job and I really didn't want to be unemployed. And so I luckily was given, I also did great research with Paul Corkum and I had an invited talk at Clio, which is the big laser um, conference. And I just, again, that's what you, I can name the few really good talks I've given in my life too. And I just thought, okay, I have to give the talk of my life. There's got to be somebody in that audience that's going to want to hire me because I've just wowed them. And so I remember coming out of that session and two people followed me up. The first one with a resume saying he's looking for a job. I went, I don't know who you think I am, but I'm looking for a job, stand behind me. And the other one was the scientist from Livermore who followed me out and asked if I would come and interview there. So that's how I got the job at Livermore. But it wasn't like, yeah, everybody's coming after me. You know, I think people now think, oh, she got a PhD there must, or a, a Nobel Prize. There must have always been people just wanting me, you know. Um, when I finished my PhD, Reagan Star Wars was booming. And again, and I talk about this, this the beautiful thing about being a woman in those days was that when I went into a bathroom at a, at a Clio conference, I was like the, usually the only one. <laughs> it's the only time. You can't go to the ballet or the theater, not happening, but at a Clio conference, a woman can go into an empty bathroom. But there was one other woman in there one time and she worked for Rocketdyne and she said, are you Donna Strickland? And I went, yeah. She goes, we would love to hire you at Rocketdyne. And I said, mm, I'm a Canadian. I don't think I'm gonna fit in Rocketdyne. Um, but that was about the only time I remember a job flying my way. So. No, I mean, and I was lucky to get the Princeton job and I was lucky to get the Waterloo job. So I just like each time when somebody wanted to hire me, I went. I did not have a big uh, rush of people trying to hire me. Oh, that's ever. excellent. Okay, we have another question. Uh, Sally Mae Tafigi, uh, she just graduated with her PhD. So okay. Sally Mae, you're up. 
Hi, Dr. Strickland. Uh, my question is that uh, how were you attracted or interested in science and uh, how do you think that we should promote uh, science to school students? Thank you. Well, I, I've already said this uh, today. I was good at very little. Um, you know, I am always impressed with people who could either, I had friends who could go to law school or PhD in science and wow, isn't that amazing to be so good. Um, you know, and I was not artistic and I was not musical and I was not athletic and I was not, you know. So I think I knew very young that science was my niche and that that's where I belong. So again, I didn't have to think too hard about it. That's where I belong. Um, so I guess not everybody's exposed to it. One of the things I'm trying to do with my sort of Nobel you know, banner uh, is science literacy, which is different than science outreach. Science outreach is to get children involved. But I think uh, as a world, and the one plus side of this COVID thing that I think is that we're hearing all the political leaders finally once again saying we have to listen to scientists. We were getting a bum rap for the longest time, right? Um, and a lot of politicians over um, the climate and stuff were saying, don't listen to scientists. So I'm <clears throat> kind of worried about that. And so, but again, uh, we're talking about maybe even starting an institute here about it. And that, but I think we have to bring in the sociologists and the psychologists along with the scientists. It can't just be scientists going out and giving good talks or doing these things because we only find the people that are already interested in science in those events. Um, so I'm looking forward to if we ever, it was supposed to start if this COVID hadn't started our kickoff meeting about it and trying to bring these groups of people together um, to discuss how is it that we get the uninitiated to listen and want to be involved. Um, but, but otherwise I think, I mean, it's easy. I go out to uh, elementary school and it's easy to get them fascinated with science. There was not an elementary school kid who isn't fascinated by science. What happens along the way? I don't know, but, uh, that's what we got to try to figure out. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, up next is Baha Saleh, our oh, former wow. Dean. Hi, Donna. Hello. Thanks for being with us today. My question is, are you considering a different post-Nobel career? Such as <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a funny. national research lab, Donna, maybe a prominent college or university. What about a political career? <laughs> political career. Uh, no. Um, I kudos to everybody who wants to go into politics. Uh, I don't know why anybody wants to beat themselves up that badly, but I love the fact that they do. Um, no, I have to say the one time after, while I was telling you that I haven't been inundated with job offers, you get a Nobel prize and people think that you should be good at everything. Uh, and I've already pointed out, I'm good at very little. So uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I don't want to necessarily take on more administration and I don't want to take on, um, I think the difference would be if we can get this science literacy off the um, ground that I could pivot and work, not, you know, take some of my science time and start working towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I'm also getting more involved with politicians because one of the things I'm doing with OSA is um, photonics for environmental measurement and monitoring. Mm -hmm. And we had trouble, you know, getting government people to listen to us, but it's so much easier with a Nobel Prize. Thank you. But I like to stay in my safety zone, Baha. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, Peter Delfiet is, is up oh, next. Oh my goodness. Good morning, Donna. How are you doing? Oh, you wore your graduation. Very good. Okay. Yes, I have my hat on. Exactly, exactly. You know, as uh, the audience here has probably figured out, Donna's husband is also a very well-respected uh, scientist and physicist in the area of ultra-fast optics. And so Donna, first and foremost, please give my best regards to Doug. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Doug and I shared an office back at University of Rochester nearly 39 years ago. Whoa. So, so the key question is, Donna, how is Doug enjoying being your plus one? I will say that I will put my male Nobel spouse up against any female Nobel spouse. He is doing really great. Um, he does travel with me as much as we can. It was funny, last year he had a trip at the end of the year to China 
And he had traveled so much with me. And I went, I'm sorry, this is your one trip and I should go with you, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> I'm staying home for a week. Um, but no, he, you know, OSA made pins of me. I don't know if you've got your OSA pin of me. That goes on. If we're dressed in Texas, it goes on. If we're dressed in suits, it goes on. Um, if I put my Nobel pin on, he puts his Donna Strickland pin on. Uh, nice. And so he's been a very proud supporter. He's out there at anything that's ever mentioned about me has to go on his LinkedIn site. I don't know if you're on his LinkedIn site, but you'll see that he is one of my biggest cheerleaders. Uh, yes, so he's he is. He's doing really I, I, great. Now, I going back it. to Baja's question, though, and some of the others, he keeps, you know, he followed me here. And now he goes, well, is it my turn now? Or, <laughs> or are you letting me know about the other job offers to see if I want? <laughs> so, yeah. Very nice. Thank he's doing you. great. Excellent. Got a question from Christina Willis at, in the YouTube channel um, who wants to know, she says, uh, as a laser scientist, I'd like to know what interested you in lasers. Also like to know if you've seen the movie Real Genius, which is her inspiration. Well, no to the movie, so I have not seen Real Genius. Uh, well, there's different stories about what got me into lasers. Uh, because sometime in the past, because my mother's now gone, uh, she heard me say something and she said, no, Donnie, you're wrong about that. The reason you like lasers is that we took you to the Ontario Science Center uh, when it first opened. And I couldn't believe actually, you know, thinking back, because I, I don't remember this, uh, but they actually had a CO2 laser. Now this is 1969. So it's only nine years after it's invented and this Science Center in Toronto had a CO2 laser. And apparently what my dad, who was an electrical engineer, said to the kids, he said, come over, you have to see this, this is the way of the future. Okay, so maybe as a 10 year old, that's what spawned it, I don't remember it. But um, when I was trying to decide where to go to university for undergrad and looking through the calendars, I, I couldn't decide between physics and engineering and McMaster had a engineering physics program. And I'm like, great, get to walk the line. And then I'm reading about engineering physics there and they had one of the four sections was lasers and electro optics. And just in my gut again, I went, wow, that sounds like fun. Let's go do that. So, I mean, again, it was a gut reaction, but maybe it was because I saw that cool laser back in 1969. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, and then we've got Shima Mirzei, who is getting their PhD uh, in physics. Hello, Dr. Strickland. Um, I am uh, very interested to know more about the postdoc experience. Since I'm moving to Ottawa, uh, I will start the postdoc with Dr. Paul Kirkham. Oh, lucky you. When you talk about your experience, make my gut feeling very good about it. But I want to see for someone who's following a, a path in academia, what is really the takeaway from the postdoc life or, or what should be the main focus of that time to, to be able to follow, you know, an academic path later on? Okay, well, okay. And go, again, going back to Baha's question, if I could do any job forever, it would be being a postdoc. Okay, that's the sad thing about being a postdoc is you only get to do it for three years because it's the only time that you actually do nothing but science, all right? It's, it's your faculty, as somebody else responsible for bringing in the money. Now, when I did it, he was strictly at the NRC, right? So it was a different thing. He wasn't even writing grants, um, but he was responsible for all of that. There was no committee, there was no TA, and there was no taking classes. There was just me doing research. Um, I've also though been to Paul's birthday party slash, you know, uh, symposium for out of seconds. And there were a lot of his people in the room and I let them know that I was his second postdoc. Okay. And uh, a friend of mine, Claude Willand was his first postdoc. And we, he, the whole group in my day was Paul, his technician, Dave and his postdoc. So totally different now because he's got this giant group. So I don't think you get to have Paul like I got to have Paul. I will tell you that when I worked with Paul, he went swimming at lunch too and he would come back and go, Donna, this is what I was thinking when I was doing laps. What do you think about this? And we'd have a discussion. And then he would come in and in the morning, he would say, Don, I was mowing the lawn last night and this is what I was thinking. Or he came back from his um, uh, trip to down east where he comes from. He goes, Don, I was watching the waves break and I really think, you know, and so there was always these times and he had to have this conversation and he certainly had them with his fellow scientists, but I was his one and only postdoc. 
And so I got a tremendous education with Paul because every day, a few times a day, we were just sitting there either in the lab, but we each had our own lab um, or around coffee or something and had that opportunity to talk to him. Um, I think he has surrounded himself with fabulous scientists right now. I think you'll have a great time. It won't be the same experience because I've talked to some of his students and they don't see him very often. He's also now traveling the whole. Back when I was working with him, I knew he was a big deal before the whole world knew he was a big deal, you see. And so um, he was not going to every conference and being honored everywhere and, and having to travel everywhere. So he was also there in the lab. Um, but yeah, he's surrounded by great people. So just do science. This is your one chance to do nothing but science and make the most of it. And you'll have a great time. And Ottawa's a great city. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from uh, YouTube. Uh, Josie Lorenzo is asking, who graduated from our college with her bachelor's degree and also her master's degree from Rochester. And she wants to know about what to do about increasing the number of women in the field of optics and photonics and what advice you have to encourage girls to follow in science and math? Well, I think at the undergrad level, it's going up all the time. I think, um, you know, I think I was hearing the numbers. I think they have 40% in their incoming class or something or, or in their first year class now that are women. Um, so I'm not one of the people that think that women need to be looked at as much as I think the other minority, uh, well, women aren't a minority. But if you look at it, we're 50%. And in a lot of places, we're well over 30% um, of the places in, in STEM. Biology is well over 50% now. If you look at just STEM, I think at undergrad, you'll find that we're, we're there. Um, I would say it's, it's much harder uh, for the other minorities here in Canada, the Indigenous. You hardly ever see some an Indigenous person in science. So I think um, there's people out there that are, are, are less being pulled into STEM than women. But um, I think it's out there. Uh, and I, I think there's right now, I've never seen as much effort put into it. I mean, I've gone to umpteen different universities now and I am always at the women in optics or women in physics or women in science. Every school I've gone to has one of these things. So I think women are starting to feel included. Good, thanks. Our final question is from Jason Eichenholz. Uh, he is the co-founder and Chief Technology Officer of Luminar Technologies and got his PhD from Creole back in like 1998. Jason. Morning, Dr. Strickland. Thank you so much for doing this for our graduates today, especially in times like today. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, first, congratulations to all the graduates today. Uh, I have to say this at least once in a ceremony. Go Knights. So Dr. Strickland, how has your life and also your career changed the most? after being awarded the Nobel Prize? Oh, well, uh, so my life changed a lot. Uh, it's actually, since COVID, it's gone back. Um, I was uh, taken out of teaching and service for the most part uh, and just given the opportunity to travel. And so actually in February, when I was looking at my calendar, I was almost scared. I was only gonna be home about three or four days a month um, right till August 11th when I would come home supposedly from Australia and then finally get three weeks and I was just gonna crash at my cottage. Um, and I was thinking, will I still be standing by August 11th? Um, so now <laughs> I'm back. I'm actually uh, now getting ready to teach my grad course online. Uh, so I'm going back to being Donna Strickland, the professor instead of Donna Strickland, the laureate. Um, so yeah, so that's the biggest change. Uh, it's just uh, how much you travel and how much people care about what you say. I mean, it's sort of funny is that I have no more insight and no more anything to offer, but uh, you know, people didn't care before, and now they seem to care. All right, well, thanks so much. I'm gonna to toss over to Dave for any last minute words. I really, really appreciate your time uh, interacting with our students. Okay, well, th thanks. Uh, Donna, this has been great. We, we could have kept going all morning, but uh, um, we do have to draw this to a close. Uh, I know you've got other things to do and well, maybe you don't these days with uh, COVID-19, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, probably our graduates have some celebrating to do. Mm -hmm. I I'd like to thank everyone for their excellent questions. And uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to everyone uh, to ask your questions, but I do thank you all for attending and participating. And most of all, Donna, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today and making this a truly memorable occasion for our spring class of 2020. 
Yeah. Congratulations, all. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks again to to uh, to everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and continue to social distance. Stay safe. And congratulations to all our graduates. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye bye.